wrongly fitting shoes? What are some of the issues that can happen? Friction is probably one of the biggest issues that you would face. Over time, that's what then would create. Just take a bit of time to make sure you're getting the right footwear. Don't just squeeze into something that looks good, but make sure it's comfortable as well. The shoe should hold onto the foot, not the foot trying to hold onto the shoe. And that's really important because... How much room should someone have between the big toe and the end of the shoe? People do studies on this sort of stuff as well too. Roughly you're working on somewhere between. Welcome to the Comfort Walk and Talk, where every step towards comfort is a step towards a healthier you. We're your hosts. Jeff. Alana. And Ben. Together, let's transform our lives from the ground up. Welcome. Firstly, we're in the wonderful Gold Coast Intercontinental Hotel at Sanctuary Cove. Why are we here? Because we're doing an amazing new product launch of some of our new shoes. And we're really fortunate to be here today with Jason and Sophie McKellen. Now, you've met Sophie before. They are husband yep. and wife, but they are the preeminent paediatric podiatrists in Australia. Mm -hmm. There's only about 10 experts in the market and these guys know everything about children's feet. We've but, got two of them. And we've got two of them. So, but today, we're not even really not going to talk a lot about children. We're going to talk about a topic that's dear to our heart. Because, you know, one of our principles in the Comfort Co. is about fit. And we can easily say great fitting shoes. But we want to really delve down from the experts, the people that have dealt with a lot of the fit issues, and talk about some of the reasons why fit, fitting and issues happen and why it's very important to get the right and correct pair of shoes. So... Without further ado, welcome Jason and Sophie. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having us. So a lot of people, um, you, you talk about a, a good pair, fitting pair of shoes, but that doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people. You know, you can say I'm a size 12 across the board, but that, that'd be different for different shoe brands, different, um, different feet, different people, everything like that. Can you um, tell us why it's important to have a really good fitting pair of shoes? Yeah, sure. Is that for me or you, Jess? You can leave. That's fine. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, good fitting shoes. I mean, they're incredibly important because an, an ill fitting shoe can cause all sorts of ailments, right? So if something's too big and loose, it's going to cause friction, which in turn can cause rubbing and blistering and so forth. And similarly, if something's um, on the too small side, then we can cause lots of um, short term and long term complications. So if you decide you always like your shoes far too small, then you can potentially have lesser toe deformities and things like that down the track. So getting the right shoe is obviously incredibly important and, and a pretty high priority, you know, from our perspective. Um, when you mentioned like sizing and so forth, Ben, like obviously a, a lot of people have probably noticed over the years, they might say, oh, well, I'm a 12 in this shoe, but then I've gone over here and bought an 11 and a half in that shoe. And that's why it's really important to actually where you can try on the shoes, make sure you're getting the right size prior to, rather than just assuming that I'm a 12, I'm always a 12. Cause there's a lot of variation and, and difference between brands and across styles and things like that. So making sure that you're, that you are trying on every shoe, not just assuming mm. that you're going to be the same size all the time is obviously incredibly important to make sure you get that right fit. So what, what, what are some of the, the things that happen with wrong shoes, wrongly fitting shoes on the foot? What are some of the issues that can happen and injuries or problems? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So the mechanics probably comes down to um, the foot moving in the shoe if it's ill-fitting and probably then as well pressure from the shoe on the foot too. And lots of times there can be similarities in a lot of those presentations, but lots of times there can be differences as well too. So... Friction is probably one of the biggest issues that you would face in a situation like that where there's just an ill fit between the shoe and the foot. Um, and lots of times if that happens over time, that's what then would create some of those angular contracture sorts of deformities where things are just not necessarily forming in the right spots. Um, soft skin that turns to hard skin as a Is that a callus? Sign. Is, that, is that what a callus is? Or? Yeah, it certainly is in its basic format. And once that becomes a little bit more concentrated with longer term pressure, that's what then creates what most people would know as corns as well too. So two different sorts of paloma without getting too technical associated yeah. with it all. But lots of times that stems from the pathway, an ongoing pathway of just things not necessarily fitting correctly as well. If a shoe's too big, let alone too tight, then lots of times that's movement of the foot within the shoe as well too, and that can create a whole host of other problems as well too. Is that one of the, one of the reasons? So I, I hear like claw toes when they're trying to hold on to the shoe. Does that come from too big a yeah. footwear potentially? Yeah, or? so a typical scenario in that circumstance would be that there would be 
an ill fit across the front of the shoe where the toes obviously reside and over time there's some contracture trying to offset for the movement of the foot within the shoe and then lots of times as well as that contracture takes place then you just get friction and rubbing from the shoe from the toes on the shoe itself too um, so those two things can work hand in hand and I often say to people when I'm fitting shoes as well Jeff I like to say the shoe should hold on to the foot, not the foot trying to hold on to the shoe. Amazing. And that's really important because if you've got an ill-fitting shoe, then generally speaking, particularly if it's on the too big size, a bit too sloppy and so forth, then generally how do we accommodate to make that shoe stay on our foot? The toes, claw, like you were saying, we grab, we change our foot position to hold on to the shoe. So if you've got a really great fitting shoe, lots of points of adjustability, and then then the shoe is just a house around the foot and it should be holding on perfectly to the foot. Because mm. hold, holding on to the shoe, that would affect the way you walk and all of those mechanics, everything like that as well, wouldn't it? Yep, 100%. Yeah, yeah. So yep. sometimes the things that you notice and the things that people would complain about is just the tip of the iceberg if that happens over a longer time frame as well too. Yeah. So um, I was recently um, in uh, look, working with a scanner that we have in Singapore and, mm. you know, so I was on the f floor with the – with the uh, customers and we would have gone through, we would have met a hundred people and put them on the scanner. Mm. What amazed me was that pretty much everyone, their foot length was different from one foot to another, three mm. millimeters, two millimeters. Yep. But, you know, <laughs> yep. the width, it was amazing. And, and yet I reflect on, you know, we obviously make shoes and I reflect on how we make them and we make them exactly the same left and right. Yeah. That must be a real problem. Do you see you know, that whole issue of, you know, how do people deal with that issue? Yeah, so it is, it's, it's a very, very common sort of presentation mm. we would see all the time. The general rule of thumb is that you would fit to the bigger foot. Okay. Yeah. And then lots of times as podiatrists, we're making accommodations for the fit of the smaller foot within the shoe as well too. It's much more difficult to try to make a shoe that's too small fit a bigger foot than one where the shoe is slightly bigger than the foot itself. But those sorts of things we encounter regularly um, and there's just mm. no rules around growth and no rules around symmetry at all. So it can sometimes be a difficult thing to deal with mm. longer term. So how, how much room should someone have between the big toe and the end of the shoe? Yeah, well, believe it um, or not, people do studies on this sort of stuff as well too for um, we say veri verification of toe allowance with regards to the end of the toe and the end of the shoe. Roughly you're working on somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5 centimetres is the general numerical rule associated with that. Okay. Um, but that also comes down to so many other factors. It's just the shape mm. of the shoe yes. and obviously what the depth of the forefoot's like as well, where you're taking most of those measurements from and then obviously what the person's using the shoe for. Yeah. So as a starting point, that's a fair gauge for most people to be able yeah. to start with. And we obviously, if it's a child, we're trying to allow for growth room and things like that too, as mm. compared to mm. an adult or ourselves, we know what shoe size we are. Our foot's not really going to, it's not going to grow. Um, and so... Yeah, with the kids, we're trying to give them adequate room without giving them too much room. So the younger kids that are first walking, you don't want to give them too much room that then you're causing them to trip and fall and mm. things like that. Um, but uh, I, I guess a good way of, um, for ourselves, like as adults, like testing if that shoe is the right length, a good guide is always just like roughly your thumb's width mm. yeah. um, in terms of length from the longest toe, which isn't always the first toe. Sometimes it's the second toe, it can be longer. Um, but roughly like a thumb's width to the end of the shoe. And you want to actually, don't just pop the shoe on sitting either, because as soon as you stand up, your foot elongates because you weight bear. So your arch profile lengthens. Yeah. So you're putting weight. So you need to be standing to check your length and then better still, um, if you can also rise up onto the balls of your feet as well, because you, your foot through that, um, the, the cycle, the gait cycle does you know, shift forward in the shoe as we're walking as well. So don't just think you can sit down and check the length and it's all fine. Yeah, just selfishly here for me as well, because just because I'm curious. Um, I, I have some some kids myself. Um, what's a good rule of thumb for, for picking kid shoes? Because I, I, you do want that bargain. You do want to be able to let them have it for a while. But again, as you were saying that, yeah, my, my little girl has had some tumbles and I feel quite bad about <laughs> it. But yeah, where, where, should, uh, where should we be looking for when buying shoes for our girls? Well, kid shoes, let, we'll break it down. We'll start it with like pretty much if they're like first walkers. So we're taking like first steps. We don't want to give those kids too much room because they're still really establishing their gait cycle and, and learning how to walk, right? So 
pretty much with those sorts of kids, oftentimes we're fitting them in store and like for ourselves, we're, we're only giving them, you know, five mil or so growth room. We do um, let the parents know that potentially they're going to be back in a few months. <laughs> um, See you soon. Yep, it will be the case. But you, you can cause quite a few issues if you're putting a shoe that's too big, you know, yeah. on that child. Then um, if you've got a kid that we're talking more like primary school age, you know, maybe seven, eight, nine years old, something like that, you can give them a good amount of growth room. I mean, they know, they've they established their gait, they're walking comfortably, they're running around everywhere. So you can give them a nice, you know, more like that 15 mil of growth room or just over your thumb's width of growth room. And generally then those kids are sort of like, what, six, nine months, hopefully, <laughs> they're getting out of their shoes. But it's so important to just like we're always saying to parents, like keep checking the size because um, – and just checking that the shoe's still fitting correctly because so often parents come back in and they're just like horrified that the child's jumped up like two, three sizes because mm. they just didn't even think to check. Yeah. So it's like just – stay on top of it, regularly checking, you know, that size because growth can happen at any time for them. So. I actually uh, just scored a, a new pair of shoes from my stepbrother. Um, his mum bought them for him just before a growth spurt. Yep. He wore them one time and now they're mine. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perfect. And that's exactly what happened. Yep, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was pretty happy with that. We generally sort of say as well too at the clinic, like an easy rule for parents is just really try and match the shoe to the child's activity, what they're yeah. choosing to do. And obviously when the children are younger in the preschool age, it can be very varied. And so you're looking for all rounders, but then as they get a little bit older, that's a really sort of an important sort of takeaway mm. rule, I suppose. We sort of try and reinforce with parents as well around the growth that can be unexpected and generally more than what parents would probably hope for or expect. And then really just trying to match mm. the activity. Once you get those two things right, generally everything it's sort of easy to manage after that. Mm. But the activity one is super important because like I totally agree with Jason, what, what we're often find is, is that a parent will come back in and say, oh, these, they didn't last. And, and it's like, well, what's a child using this shoe for? And maybe they're in a really lightweight sneaker with a really light textile toe, you know, across the front, like a mesh sort of front. And then it's like, oh, they use it as a scooter and the shoes a break. Mm. And then they're, at, you know, on a swing at the park and the shoes also a break or, you know, it, really considering maybe they were better off with something with a really robust toe bumper at the front of the shoe or something that's like far more suited to that child's activity, that child's mm. needs. It's really that, important. That's something you guys do quite well with, with your brand Scoby, isn't it? Is your, your school shoes are all rounders, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm. And, and heaps of options there for the kids to like match themselves with a shoe that's appropriate to their use again. So, you know, you can have more of like a, a formal sort of style Mary, Mary Jane, perhaps for the kids that aren't, you know, belting around in them all day <laughs> long and riding a scooter to school. But then for that child that is riding a scooter to school, you know, pick something like the page Mary Jane, it's got a lot more of a robust toe yeah. bumper at the front. So you're really matching them with their, with their activity. The, the, the scooter shoes, the footy boots, That's the running it. shoes. The everything shoes. Yeah. The good news with, with me is I, I've got two girls, so... Chances are, you know, when, when my oldest Penny grows out of a pair of shoes, then Tilly will get them not soon after. Is, <laughs> is there anything um, that I should be looking out for there? Is there any issues that that could bring up? Yeah, with the, the shoe hand-me-down sort of scenario, we get asked about this frequently. Good for the green economy. It's yeah, very right. good for that, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, you're right, Jeff. So I don't know. Like I can look at this from both perspectives. Yeah. Like we're parents as well. I'm a mum and I sort of – you know, if we don't have to go out there unnecessarily and throw more money on shoes, then of course, if there's a saving to be had, let's do it. But um, I guess generally what I say to anyone is I say, bring them in, let me have a look at them. Because <laughs> because plenty of times it is a yes. Like it's, you know what, we can, we can do a little bit of a hand-me-down here. And particularly when the children are younger, because they might've only been in them for like four weeks, like a month yeah. or something, there's little to no wear. So we generally like turn the shoe over, have a look at the sole and we're saying, oh, there's like no wear at all in that outsole because as kids wear shoes for longer and longer, obviously you're going to see a few changes in, in the shoe itself. So sometimes you'll see sort of a bit of an angular um, sort of formation happening on the outsole where there's been excess wear. Um, obviously that's not ideal. You don't want to then pass that on to the next child and then you're changing Just on that, for them. Just on that topic, I was going to ask that question. Actually, with the heel, you know, where the heel wears, mm. wears out on the outside, is, that, is there a point where that's not good, you know, to have a worn, a, you know, a worn heel? Does that really change your whole gait? And, and, yeah, and, well, you know? do you want this one, Jase? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sure. Um, yeah, that is. But then 
very much that comes out of the quality of the shoe as well yeah. too. So lots of times things will be intertwined together. We yeah. try to, at the clinic, we try to educate parents about wear patterns through the sole unit itself. Yeah. Um, you know, we joke around, we can be shoe detectives with the kids as well too and sort of tell what they've been up to, um, but it's not hard to sort of teach parents or, um, you know, obviously guardians about those sorts of wear patterns within the shoes. And so lots of times one thing will lead to another and lead to another, but the higher the quality in the shoe, those things will be held in check. Yeah. So take a typical sort of mid-range shoe and you would see wear on the outside of the heel to a yeah. certain point that creates an angle. And obviously then what that does is that affects what the strike pattern's like for the okay. child. And then straight away that'll start to affect what we would call the heel counter of the shoe as well too. Yeah. And that'll start to distend and wear out a little bit and that'll contribute to that as well. And that can create a lot of instability okay. for kids particularly when they're not necessarily... And adults as well, though, I guess, isn't it? And, and adults as well. And All adults ages. as well. It's exactly yeah. right. It's exactly mm. right. Oftentimes yeah. adults will hang on to that favourite pair of shoes and they want yeah. to continue on with that for as long as they possibly can and offset getting those sorts of things repaired. And it can be the yeah. same sort of consequences longer term as well yeah. too. So those sorts of things you write, Jeff, they can be very much a factor in terms of how well that shoe's working for that child or that adult yeah. and how long those sorts of shoes might last. Because shoe repair is sort of not done that much now was it really yeah. the soles have changed so much yeah. but that's that's a trade that used to be there always used to be a heel replacement going on mm. yeah. on shoes so that's changed yeah, a little think... bit thin on the ground um, yeah. unfortunately these days you're right there's a little bit yeah. more of that disposable economy associated with those sorts yeah. of uh, things like shoes like so yeah. many different sorts of clothing products as yeah. well too unfortunately yeah. no yeah. i was just gonna agree entirely like we just find that it is like we've just become this disposable society haven't yeah. we unfortunately well i remember um, the retread tire Mm. That yeah. doesn't exist mm. anymore, no, it does doesn't. No. The retread tire, you know, was like no. amazing. And y yeah, you can't. And, you know, to a lot of those repairs and things, unfortunately, these days cost as much as a new pair of shoes. Yeah. So it's very rare that people are yeah. opting for repairs and yeah. and so forth. In, in saying that, though, there has been a bit of a, a resurgence of the, the vintage movement, isn't it? So... You know, you get your, your 1980s Doc Martens and what a, what a score that is. But, Retro stuff, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but what, what you were just saying, that's that's the ultimate hand-me-down. So if, yeah. if I do find my, my 1980s pair of bloody stompers mm -hmm. the, that, I'm, <laughs> that I'm in love with, what, what kind of precautions should I be taking there? Well, it depends. Were they handed down from yourself or have you gotten them oh, from no, someone vintage, else? Oh, no, vintage. They cost me a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you pick these up and they've belonged to someone else, I guess there's a few things you want to look out for. Fumigation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that might be number one. <laughs> but ideally, I'd be looking at the sole wear. So I'd yeah. be turning them over and saying, look, if literally at the heel it's sort of skived at an angle like this, I'd probably be saying, unless you're going to get them resold somewhere, mm. I'd probably be suggesting that you might be better off just purchasing a new pair. Um, and the same kind of thing, and I we guess. We've got plenty of shoes. <laughs> we've got plenty. We've got plenty. <laughs> um, I guess as well, like the integrity of the upper. So like often I say this, you know, whether it's parents with kids or adults or whatever that are, you know, are, are these shoes still okay? Over time, a shoe loses a lot of its integrity. So yeah. just if you're doing those 10,000 steps a day or whatever yeah. it might be, then over time the, the midsole of the shoe, which is often like EVA or a rubber or something, you just going to get compression over time. Yeah. And so when a shoe loses its integrity, it therefore loses its support as well. Yeah. So if you're still expecting that shoe to be like <laughs> optimal support and doing all these favorable things for your feet, then good chances, probably not. Probably not. So you and all your, you know, you, you see a lot of people, um, re replacing their shoes and what, what is, what would you say? And it's a tough question, but the average lifespan of a shoe today, would you expect? Oh, in paediatrics, I suppose it's one of those situations where you always expect the child to grow out of the shoe rather yeah. than obviously the yes. shoe fails. So that would be very much a standard sort of litmus test for yeah. most of the shoes that we would yeah. obviously recommend or want to yeah. um, stock and fit. I think for adults overall, it really comes down to hours per week in terms yeah. of wear as well too. So that's again, shoe fit for activity and so yeah. forth as well. So an like active shoe that they're going to wear three times a week, four times a week, what would you... Yeah, I'd be 12 saying... months, nine months? Yeah, I'd be oh. saying somewhere right in the middle of that. I'd be saying yeah. somewhere between four and six months. You'd okay. be expecting to have months. that through oh. so yeah. that you can have that assessed and obviously it's, see. Yeah, because mm. yeah. that's that's very interesting, something that, you know, our, our, our audience really should take note of because there is a lot of expectation that you buy a shoe and it's going to last you for years, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. the, the movement towards softer midsole materials yeah. 
yeah. um, and all the research and obviously diversification in that just means that you just don't necessarily have something that's just going to be as robust and going to last as long. Yeah. No matter what's on the top and what's on the bottom, the midsole is such an important part of the shoe yeah. as well. And once you get failure and fatigue in that, then the rest of the shoe just doesn't really it's work. It's not doing well. any good, is no, it? There's just, no questioning. And, no, uh, it's things we talked about before where one thing just besets another and the shoe's yeah. just integrated together yeah. as well. So um, it's a really, really important part. And unfortunately, one of the downsides to technology is yeah. obviously just how long those things will last for. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been fantastic. I mean, it really has been a great episode. The real message to to consumers is just take a bit of time to make sure you're getting the right footwear. Don't mm. just squeeze into something that looks good, but make sure it's comfortable as well. And there's there's a real balance. And there's plenty and plenty of options that are comfortable on the market today. Mm. So be quite fussy, mm. all right? Mm. Because a lot of options now look extremely good, but they need to provide you that level of comfort. Yeah. So thanks, guys. And uh, for our listeners Great. at home as well, the, the Comfort Co has uh, perfect fit features there as well. You can get that right pair of shoes every single time. And if you don't, our return policy is second to none as well. So so make sure that you yes. can take them for a walk around at home. Because if they you want to try right, them on. Before you want to try them yep. on. Yes. Got to make uh, sure they're right. If, if they don't fit well, that's all right. Send them back. We'll send you another pair. Too that's easy. It. Give them that um, give, give them the, that give, them the at home give them the twist. Give them the twist. Before. Where can our listeners find you guys? All right. Well, we're, we're in Brisbane ourselves in Corinda. So um, Little Big Feet. Yeah. podiatry clinic there's a plug for ourselves there um yeah. that's the clinic that you'll find us in and um in terms of footwear advice and all that kind of thing as well always happy to give that you can visit littlebigfeet.com.au and um shoot us an an yeah. email or a contact form and we'll we'll always help out with that kind of thing anyway and we said it before but these guys invented the scoby school shoe range so and we sell that and now they're talking the about Coast, so fantastic <laughs> absolutely well, thanks a lot guys thank you very much Thank you for joining us on the Comfort Walk and Talk by The Comfort Co. If you like this episode and you got something out of it, we would love your support with a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Don't forget to subscribe on your favourite channels and never miss a step on your journey to comfort. Please follow us for more insights and updates on The Comfort Co. social media channels. Until the next episode, see you later.